Hey everyone, David C. Anderson here coming at you from the Knife Center and welcome to Knife AQ number 93. The Knife series where I answer all your questions, whether they're sharp or dull. And this week, we're taking a look at some different sheath materials, talking about which ones may be quote unquote best. And we're also going to attempt to answer the question, is there such a thing as a gentleman's survival pocket knife? Let's get into it. All right, if you're new to this series, here is the deal. There's a comments section below this video. In most there places. Is. In most places. If you're watching this on your, your actual television, it might be hard to get to. But through most other formats, there is a, uh, a uh, uh, what's the word? Comments section down below. There is? Inauspicious start to this episode. Leave your questions down in that comments section and we will comb through and uh, pick a few out for inclusion in a future episode. So that's what you gotta do. This week, first question came from the comments section below the video. There is one? Yes, it is, yes. And this, this came from it. It's from Chris Hines. Sorry, folks. Uh, question, what makes the best sheath material? Leather, kydex, plastic, or other? Could you give the pros and cons? Thanks. Um, sure. Kind of, whenever we think about like what is best when you have such disparate materials here, it's it's a question without a real answer or without any kind of actual honest answer. Because what is gonna be best is all gonna depend on your needs and what you want your sheath to do for you. And there's reasons to pick all of these, essentially. All right, we'll start with uh, a leather sheath shown on this LT Wright Saks powder here. This is a JRE Industries made leather sheath. Uh, for one thing, leather is a renewable resource. That's kind of nice. Uh, certainly an argument to be made that that is a, uh, a good thing. And I would in fact make that argument. Um, it's also, as you could see when I was sheathing that knife right here, it's quieter than Kydex. I'll hold up this uh, Actinon Verba that we're gonna show next as an example. Got clicks, rattles going on, that sort of thing. And even if you're wearing the, the uh, sheath and moving around things, you know, it's a little, uh, little tappier, a little noisier than the softer leather. So that can be an advantage. Uh, you know, there's certainly some tactical reasons to like that, but I think for most, where most folks are gonna encounter that would be stuff like uh, hunters, especially. There's something to be said for uh, preferring that quieter nature if you're moving through brush and that sort of thing. Um, let's see, disadvantages. It's not really good for long-term storage. I will say that. Uh, if you store a knife in a leather sheath, you can lead to a little bit of discoloration on blades sometimes, especially if it's a uh, carbon steel, much less likely on a stainless. Uh, but also if you have brass fittings like this right here, those can uh, discolor, have some corrosion. The, uh, the good green, green gook monster, it's a technical term, look it up, uh, can show up if you store a knife a long term in a leather sheath like that. Uh, you're not gonna get as much positive retention as you will out of a Kydex sheath with leather. You can have a pouch style sheath right here that does give you a friction fit, but can come loose. Or you can do a uh, leather sheath with some straps like you see on this nylon sheath right here. But those straps can sometimes get in the way, might uh, accidentally slice them. That's another uh, disadvantage. Um, you also have to care for leather more than any of the synthetic materials we're gonna look at whether it's uh, some kind of leather conditioner or other stuff that's gonna help it keep from drying out over time. And that moisture is, is kind of a, uh, a double-edged sword because you don't want it to be soaking wet either or, or sopping because it can hold moisture against the knife blade itself. Another thing that can cause some discoloration. And it can even like mold or mildew in under the right circumstances if it's left unattended and left soaking wet for a long time. Up other side of that, you can wet form a sheath using water and uh, get a tighter friction fit. So there's a lot of, uh, some of those aren't necessarily goods or bads, but just some things to look out for, so to speak. Uh, moving on to Kydex, we have it on an uh, Actin on Verba. What's the name? The N311. Very, very cool knife, by the way. You get positive retention out of a Kydex sheath in exchange for that kind of noisiness, so to speak. Most, uh, or any well-made Kydex sheath, you shouldn't be able to shake the knife out of the, uh, the sheath just by doing it like so. If, you, if I got really going, it might be able to happen, but I'm not gonna do that here at the table. Um, 
So that's definitely an, you know, that's the main reason to enjoy a Kydex sheath. Uh, also, you see we've got a, a modular hole pattern here essentially on this Kydex sheath, which allows it to be carried in multiple different fashions more easily than most leather sheaths. But those can be made to do similar things. And I guess that's really more down to uh, the people who are designing the sheaths in those, those cases. It's not necessarily a, uh, you know, a plus or minus to the material itself. That's just what we tend to see more often. You're going to get that modularity with a, uh, a Kydex sheath. Um, also mildew resistant or mildew proof, I should say. This is a, a water impervious material. Water can get in between the layers, sure, but it's not going to mold or mildew or anything like that. I suppose some mold could grow on the surface if the right whatever was uh, on it, but that just meant your sheath wasn't clean in the first place, probably. I just pressure wash it. Exactly. Or you can go that far, just wipe it off, probably. Um, downsides to Kydex, as mentioned, it's noisier. That may or may not matter to most folks. Uh, also, in really cold environments, it can get more brittle which you know, you'd hate to have your, uh, your sheath shatter on you if uh, things are super frigid. Um, also, the, even the best made Kydex sheaths can scuff the blade that's going into them. And that's not even necessarily because grit has been trapped in between there, which is also a disadvantage of most Kydex sheaths. They're hard to clean if you, know, you do get dust or anything in there. But even without uh, dust or anything to kind of scratch the blade, you can get some wear marks, some patterning, some scuffing from a Kydex sheath onto the blade itself. So is that uh, worth the trade-off for you for the positive retention? If so, great. All right, let me just uh, check my, my bullets here, make sure I got all the points I want. Yeah, um, so the main points I made between these two styles are gonna inform the, uh, the next couple of styles of sheaths. Um, typically, Leather sheaths and Kydex sheaths are a bit pricier, or they're not even necessarily pricey per se, but there's ways production companies can get similar effects to leather or Kydex without resorting to those materials. And especially when you're dealing with a mass market or a mass um, production environment, getting the cost down while retaining similar benefits, that can be best for maintaining a lower price. So again, it all depends what is best on the circumstances. But let's talk about injection molded sheaths right here with this chaos dagger from Cold Steel. Pardon the, uh, the grease, they grease those up good on the inside. Cool knife, by the way. But we're not here to talk about knives, are we? Um, well, it's a knife show. All right, we'll have some more knives in a little bit then. Um, an injection molded sheath can be similar to Kydex, uh, as is this one. You've got similar modular style of attachment points, you've got positive retention. They also happen to uh, give you an extra retention strap here, but that's not, uh, that's extra <laughs> in this case. And advantages, you've got the, uh, the positive retention, disadvantages, you've got the loudness advantage, you've got the water resistance. Uh, disadvantage, depending on the material, if it's like glass or fiber reinforced nylon, they can actually, uh, if you're not careful the way you, you sheath the blade, if you hit the edge too, uh, too aggressively, you can actually dull the edge of your blade on some of those materials. So that would be a, a disadvantage of those particular. Not all injection molded sheaths will do this, but if it's a glass filled nylon sheath, chances are it stands a decent chance of doing that. So your mileage may vary, of course, and it's also gonna depend on the actual design going on. Um, yeah, I think that's all I've got for that. Uh, definitely a, a more economical choice than Kydex because they don't need to uh, heat press pieces individually. You can injection mold all of these and go from there. Um, last but not least is nylon style sheaths. And these can be very simple from just a simple pouch, such as you, you might find on this leather sheath we showed. You can get that in nylon and it'll typically have a harder plastic uh, insert on the inside to keep from uh, keep the edge from going through, or you can be a little more involved, like on this Becker BK2. You can get stuff with pouches on the front. We've got a, uh, a hard insert on this knife, at, or on this sheath as well, two retention straps, compatibility with molly webbing and belt carry on the back. Even with all of this going on, you know, typically even on a Made in America knife like this, 
oftentimes, and you know, pretty much everyone or, or many many companies are uh, have done this. Many American companies they'll outsource the sheath manufacturing somewhere else, so you can get a full featured sheath like this while keeping the cost down. Advantage here, again, we're dealing with something unlike leather that is mildew resistant. It can get dirty, but it's not going to mold away on you. Uh, Water is not going to ruin this type of sheath. Uh, disadvantages, you're dealing with the same, uh, some of the same disadvantages of leather in terms of the retention. You don't have a positive retention here, uh, so those same things can apply. And I think that is it for that. Um, certainly there are a few other uh, specific materials, uh, sheath materials that might come up, but this kind of covers the gamut more or less of what you're going to see, at least on most production knives out there today. And I hope that helps. I hope that helps you decide what's best for you because there is no what is best again. If it covers the knife when not of use, it's 90% there. <laughs> this is true. Um, but it's that other 10% 10, 10 that's so important. That's why we have this show. Ooh. What shows that then? Anyway, next question comes from Jordan Ducham. Uh, my brother is a sinistral citizen. Left handed. I love sinistral citizen. I, I, I already knew that the root of the word sinister had to deal with left handedness. But sinistral citizen. That's almost as good as Molly Dukers, whoever was that brought that uh, euphemism to our attention. What do you think? Sinistral citizen. I was suspicious of him already. <laughs> My brother is a sinistral citizen and he's getting married. Uh, I'm the best man and I'm looking for a nice knife that's fitting for a wedding present, budget under $200, and good for someone who does both camping and for EDC as well, preferably a good folder or smaller fixed. No preference on brand, but something that's kind of both camp and gentleman, if that exists. Interesting. So a, a gentleman's survival knife, essentially. I always consider like the knife you're carrying when you're outdoors, if things go wrong, that is your survival knife. So you want it to be kind of good. Um, but this was an interesting thought experiment because normally when I think of a, a folding knife you're going to take camping, gentlemanly qualities don't like don't even enter into the brain. So I had to think through a few things. Uh, but first, this is not the first time we've talked about wedding knives, nor is it the second or third. I mean, this has come up several times, but the last time, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about wedding knives and a lot of people, this never happened on, on previous videos except for this one. Asking, like, why would you care? Like, who's carrying a knife at a wedding? How many did you carry? How many did I carry? I, uh... I had four. Th Thomas is... I'm the knife guy here more than Thomas, and Thomas carried more knives than I did at his wedding. <laughs> I saw nothing wrong with carrying the same things I carry every day. There's that. And when you, you... We talked about this. You made a good point, too, of there's something nice about carrying something from the before into the future. So, yeah, you, you made that comment. Don't don't hesitate. Yeah. <laughs> um, Continuity. There, there some some good people uh, uh, came to the defense here. It's like this is a knife guy's channel, a knife people's channel, not just guys, of course. Like, why wouldn't we carry a knife at a wedding? Just like watch people, you know, they're, you know, as as much as a knife is a tool, there's a certain element where you know a knife is also kind of an accessory, and this is where you know men get to spend a little bit of money. Again. Not just men, but stick with me here for a minute. But like buying a, a nice watch or buying a knife, it, it is a little bit of an accessorizing sort of thing. So you want to have something special to commemorate the occasion. That's one reason you might uh, have a knife, being a knife person at one's wedding. Um, sentimental value, the continuity thing uh, Thomas mentioned. For example, myself, I carried uh, one of the knives I had on me was a three-bladed slip joint, slip joint a BSA Whittler made by Camillus. It was the first good knife that I ever had. My dad gave it to me. And it's been with me through my whole knife experience, my whole life with knives. Why shouldn't it be there with me during this moment as well? It felt appropriate. It felt sentimental. And there's something to that. What if, uh, you know, I've, I know this wasn't me, but someone else I know uh, carried the knife that their grandfather gave them. Their grandfather wasn't with us anymore, wasn't with them anymore. So that was a way to have you know, his grandfather there at the wedding with him. I think there's plenty of great reasons to carry a knife at, at your wedding. Even if 
I didn't cut anything with any of the three knives I had with me at my wedding that day. But hey, what are you gonna do? Any other points, Thomas? I think we're in the weeds. There was a question. There is a question. We'll get back to it right now. So, left hand gentleman's outdoor knife that is you know, hopefully strong enough that if it had to be the quote unquote survival knife, it could be. Um, this one was funny because first thing I thought of was Benchmade Mini Crooked River, uh, but it's over your $200 budget. It is ambidextrous. It is very strong. It is outdoorsy. We'll, we'll get a picture or something up here. Uh, but we also didn't have any on the shelf the day we were filming. Uh, then I was like, all right, if I can't have that, what about the Buck 110 Sport? That's really cool. Has classic buck knife vibe. Maybe not super gentlemanly, but it, I think it rides a good line. But then I remembered the pocket clip is a, uh, a right side pocket clip. Everything else is ambidextrous, but that darn really cool knife though. S30B. Yeah. I was checking to see if it wasn't one of the S45 versions. So I quickly thought of two knives that quickly fell out of contention because of the, the left handedness and the, uh, the price on the first one. Then I thought, what about the giant mouse ace grand? It's a relatively new knife. It's a, a little bit rugged, but a little bit classy, but it's, you know, it's a right hand biased lock. The clip is reversible. The opening is uh, ambidextrous as well. And you can close a knife like that. So that could work. And it's within budget too. I mean, we're dealing with, where are we here? I do have a, uh, a tab open here somewhere, allegedly. Oh, I got an error. Well, that's good. It's, I think it's just under $200 for this knife. Elmax steel, great all around performer, comfortable handles. That's gonna be important for any kind of, you know, outdoor use, I tend to think. Pretty cool, very cool knife. But again, not quite left-handed. So then I thought, what about the Demco 20, 80.20.5 with the carbon fiber and the 3V blade? Nice tough steel with a nice, str nice strong lock. That's gonna be great for the outdoors. Also, it is ambidextrous and finger safe too. I like that, but over budget, 265 for this. And also maybe a little thin for what I would want for an outdoors knife, but you know, that, that can be subjective in this sort of thing. I would want a little more, but maybe that's okay. A lot of people carry traditional slip joints that aren't big hand filling knives either. So that could be good. So those are all of the things that I did not pick to answer the question. <laughs> But pardon my enthusiasm because it was an interesting niche for me to, uh, to think about. So I had some extra stuff. Uh, so since we couldn't have the uh, mini Crooked River, there's another knife from the Hunt line from Benchmade I think would be good. And that's the North Fork. It's a three inch blade, S30V, $180 for this. And you've got a stabilized wood handle. I don't know if it's still technically diamond wood, um, diamond wood name brand product, but it's the same type of stuff like pack of wood, that sort of thing. It's laminated layers of wood with resin or epoxy, creates a very strong wood alternative. It's actually made from wood itself. Um, and it, it's not gonna warp or crack the same way natural wood will. And it looks classy, whether in a more upscale environment or if you're heading outdoors. It's about a three and a half finger grip for me, but it's got a nice robust feel going on. So you've got that hand filling nature. The blade itself, Nice versatile drop point. You do have a hint of recurve right there. Um, I think this would work quite nicely. I've always trusted the uh, the axis lock in an outdoor environment. Uh, it's just a, you know, you got that strong engagement of the uh, tang of the blade and that crossbar there. And typically their liners full length in this case are gonna be pretty sturdy, nice and stout. And I know some folks uh, sometimes worry about the uh, springs on the axis lock breaking. In an emergency, if this is a quote unquote survival camping situation, you can always wedge something behind that if you had to. So that's nice. I think that would be a really good option. Uh, a couple more that maybe lean a little more towards the EDC side of things since chances are he's not camping every day, but he has to do other things every day. Um, maybe something like the uh, button lock elementum. Uh, maybe the uh, titanium 20 CV exclusive version right here. Price on it is about 178. You've got a lot of edge retention on the steel and this doesn't scream outdoor. I will grant you that. 
but it has a lot of the elements that make a good outdoor design. You've got a neutrally shaped handle, so all kinds of different grips are gonna work, reverse grips, chest levers, all that sort of thing. And you've got a very neutral drop point blade. It's gonna be quite useful for pretty much anything, quite honestly. And it's a right side biased button lock, but it's still super easy to operate with that left hand. And the pocket clip is reversible too. So that could be a pretty fun option. And one other leaning into a more, well, it, it's maybe not a more traditional vibe, but a different combination of traditional and modern vibes with the Knife Center exclusive Andela model from Spyderco with pack of wood handles. Just under that $200 mark, 3.4 inch blade. You've got a HAP 40 core on the laminated blade itself. So you've got that uh, high speed or that uh, powder metallurgy high performance steel there that will take a patina, which is nice. And a little bit, little bit more of that classic look. Definitely has some gentlemanly vibes, but is gonna work well outdoorsiness as well. Again, a little bit thinner on both of these handle scales, which is why I say they lean more towards the EDC side of things as opposed to the camping side of things. That'd be a great camping folder right there. Really good for uh, small amounts of food prep too. You could go with the, uh, the larger, we've got the Police 4, which has more blade, which would be better for food prep, but then it's above budget again. So I know this, uh, you've, you've made this uh, question a long time ago and I probably have missed the actual wedding and I apologize for that but it was fun to think about. And uh, I, I uncovered the question today as I was going through looking for, uh, for stuff. I had it you know, buried in, uh, in my document there. And I thought, yeah, that's a fun one. So hope that helps. Next question, Graham Blackall. What are your thoughts on standoffs versus closed back construction for everyday carry? Uh, I have concerned, concerns about open backs and pocket debris like coins or keys getting into the mechanism. What do you think? Um, Honestly, and, and this is not a snarky answer whatsoever, I wouldn't carry coins or keys in the same pocket as a knife. Um, I mean, maybe if it was an old slip joint and it's used to just kind of banging around, but I, I would probably not do that. I choose not to do that myself. But anyway, regardless of that, the I, I can see where you're coming from. Uh, an open-backed construction like this, yeah, things could get in there. The upside of that is, they are easier to clean out. I mean, even with a closed back pocket knife like this, like this Indela, there's less space for coins definitely, but lint, debris, other stuff can still get in there and you're gonna have to clean it out somehow. And it can be done, absolutely, but it is easier to do on an open backed design. Whether you're you know, using like a can, one of those cans of compressed air, shoving a Q-tip through there, or even rinsing it out under a faucet, that's gonna be a lot more conducive to that sort of thing. I don't know, uh, you say you have concerns about stuff getting in there, um, so I'm, I'm, I take it you you either haven't actually experienced it be, while carrying a uh, carrying one of these, and it's a theoretical question, or you haven't carried an open-backed knife uh, in such a fashion and you're worried. If, I don't know, if you're, if you're worried about it, I'd give it a try. There's plenty of inexpensive knives out there that are quite good uh, that you know could could get you there. I mean, tons of Savibis, for for example. Not this one right here is not a uh, an inexpensive one, but the uh, standard button lock elementum is like sixty bucks. You can get tons of knives from them under the fifty dollar mark that have similar open construction like that. So maybe check those out. Pocket fix blade. How'd you beat me to that? Uh -huh. Pocket fix blade. There we go. Lightning round. Now we've got a question from Jeremy too. Uh, why do companies not put little knife blades on solidly built pens? Seemed like that would make a good pen to be more useful and desirable. Well, I have one here and it's probably for the same reasons as the Smith & Wesson isn't more popular. It is it is kind of cool, I'll grant you, but you know, you're taking up, this is a big pen. I mean, that's quite long here. And even so you're taking up about, what's that, two fifths just for the uh, the knife mechanism, and look at how much knife you get for it. Like an inch. What do we have? What's on the what's on the spec sheet here? Ah, one and a half inch blade. I guess from tip to uh, the end of the the handle right there. So you're not getting a lot, and it's I don't know. There's easier ways I think to carry a small blade than incorporating it into a pen. But if you want to try it anyway, here is an option for you. I don't know. I don't know of any other uh, 
actual pen blades, <laughs> the actual pen knife uh, than that. I think it's the only one we carry anyway. But if you know of any others, I'd love to see them in the comments. Now, our second lightning round question comes from B. Uh, question, Wikipedia says that G10 is flammable and can burn violently. Do you think this is a real concern in say camping or cooking or rescue scenarios? No. Be Fly enough heat, anything's flammable. <laughs> it's true. Because like the G10 is not gonna spontaneously combust. And if it's in a situation where it's hot enough to combust, your knife, your knife is gonna be ruined whether it's uh, spewing flames from its G10 or not. And hopefully you're not hot enough that your knife is bursting into flames either because then that's gonna be a bigger problem. Bigger problem would be should you carry a camo handled knife in the outdoors? I'd be more worried about that. It's fine, it's urban camo. That's not urban camo. Well, anyway. Para 3, S45VN, very cool knife. But that's it for the lightning round, which brings us to our most serious question of the day, which comes from Varus65. Uh, any tips on explaining to the significant other why I spend so much money on knives? Seriously, help me out here because I don't seem to be stopping anytime soon. Well, I don't know about you, but what I did is turn this here hobby into a career so that all of my knife purchases are now, are now business expenses. So they're justified. That probably doesn't help. I'm very sorry, I can't be more helpful. It's less risky than Bitcoin. Hey, and you get more knives out of it too. This is true. That's cool. Uh, that's all the questions we have for this episode. Remember, if you want a chance to have your question featured, the comments section is down below. Whoa. Thought you were gonna say, is it again? I queued you up and everything. It's mind blown, man. If you wanna get your hands on any of these knives, Oh, the other thing you can do in the uh, comments section is let me know where you thought I was wrong on the questions today or if you have any alternate suggestions. If you wanna get your hands on any of these knives, the link's in the description, which is above the comments section. And I'm just learning all kinds of new things today. You'll find some links there that'll take you over to knifecenter.com. And don't forget our Knife Rewards program exists. It doesn't have a comments section, but it will allow you to earn some free money to spend on your next knife when you purchase one of these today. I'm David C. Anderson from the Knife Center, and that's Thomas behind the camera, and we're signing off. See you next time. And next thing you're gonna tell me is there's a subscribe button. Like, comment, subscribe.